laypersons should initiate CPR for presumed cardiac arrest. Evidence shows that the risk of harm to a victim who receives chest compressions when not in cardiac arrest is low. Lay rescuers are not able to determine with accuracy whether a victim has a pulse, and the risk of withholding CPR from a pulseless victim exceeds the harm from unneeded chest compressions. For cardiac arrest with a non-shockable rhythm, it is reasonable to administer epinephrine as soon as feasible. For cardiac arrest with a shockable rhythm, it may be reasonable to administer epinephrine after initial defibrillation attempts have failed. Randomized trials showed that epinephrine increased ROSC and survival rates. Audiovisual feedback devices during CPR may optimize CPR performance. A recent randomized control trial reported a 25% increase in survival to hospital discharge from in-hospital cardiac arrest with audio feedback on compression depth and recoil. Monitoring physiologic parameters such as arterial blood pressure or ETCO2 may optimize CPR quality. Targeting compressions to an ETCO2 value of at least 10 mm Hg and ideally 20 mm Hg or greater may be useful as a marker of CPR quality. The usefulness of double sequential defibrillation for refractory shockable rhythm has not been established. Based on current evidence, it is not known whether double sequential defibrillation is beneficial. Providers should first attempt establishing IV access for drug administration in cardiac arrest, although IV access is preferred for situations in which IV access is difficult or not feasible, IO access is a reasonable option. Post-cardiac arrest care may include coronary angiography, targeted temperature management, seizure management, ventilatory management, and glucose control. To be reliable, neuroprognostication should be performed no sooner than 72 hours after return to normothermia, and prognostic decisions should be based on multiple modes of patient assessment. Cardiac arrest survivors should have multimodal rehabilitation assessment and treatment for physical, neurologic, cardiopulmonary, and cognitive impairments before discharge from the hospital. Cardiac arrest survivors and their caregivers should receive comprehensive, multidisciplinary discharge planning to include medical and rehabilitative treatment recommendations and return to activity or work expectations, structured assessment for anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and fatigue should be provided for cardiac arrest survivors and their caregivers. The process of recovering from cardiac arrest extends long after the initial hospitalization, and this process should be initiated during the initial hospitalization and continue as long as needed. Debriefings and referral for follow-up for emotional support for lay rescuers, EMS providers, and hospital-based healthcare workers after a cardiac arrest event may be beneficial. Rescuers or healthcare workers may experience anxiety or post-traumatic stress of caring for a patient with cardiac arrest. Team debriefings may allow a review of team performance such as education and quality improvement, as well as recognition of the natural stressors associated with caring for a patient near death. Because pregnant patients are more prone to hypoxia, oxygenation and airway management should be prioritized during resuscitation from cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Because of potential interference with maternal resuscitation, fetal monitoring should not be undertaken during cardiac arrest in pregnancy. Pregnant women who survive cardiac arrest should receive targeted temperature management with consideration for the status of the fetus that may remain in utero. During targeted temperature management of the pregnant patient, it is recommended that the fetus be continuously monitored for bradycardia as a potential complication, and obstetric and neonatal consultation should be sought. What?